I'm sure most of you have heard sermons on the occasion of Palm Sunday. Uh, It has been our custom to have a a message appropriate to this day in the church calendar. Uh, For me, it's one of the best parts of my occupation to have the privilege of ministering God's Word during this week that begins with Palm Sunday and culminates with the celebration of Easter. And there are many aspects of the narrative of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem that a preacher might choose to focus on. Uh, You've likely heard sermons where the preacher talked about the expectations of the crowd, what they believed about Jesus and what they said. Uh, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. We really have to wonder what was in their hearts when five days later Jesus was hanging on a Roman cross. Where was the outrage? Where was the mass movement to have Jesus released from Pilate's custody before his execution if this is who the people really believed him to be, the king that cometh in the name of the Lord? Uh, Where were the protests at his death? Well, there weren't any. Uh, In this vein, preachers will sometimes talk about the kind of king the people wanted versus the kind of king that Jesus actually was and is and that is a very fruitful line of thought. Another notable aspect of this story is that Jesus invited all of this attention when previously he had been avoiding the crowds. Jesus set this up. He instructed the disciples to find the colt and bring it to him. Uh, He had no intention whatsoever of quietly slipping into the city. He wanted to be the focus while the city was full of Passover pilgrims and I suggest that was because he wanted to draw attention to what would be the culmination of his ministry, his death, burial and resurrection. Jesus was in command of the circumstances all along and that reminds us that he laid down his life. It wasn't taken from him. Perhaps you've heard Palm Sunday sermons where the preacher focused on the symbolism of the cult. Uh, The donkey that Jesus rode as he progressed into the city. It's clear that Jesus was evoking the coronation processions of Israel's kings. There is an allusion to Solomon and what transpired when he was made king. And then no doubt many a preacher has taken up the theme of fulfilled prophecy. Matthew and John in their accounts of this event make the connection to a prophecy given by Zechariah some 500 years prior. In that prophecy there is a wonderful description of the person and work of the king. He is just and lowly and having salvation. In our time together today, I want to focus on another aspect of this story. And really, it's not the events themselves that I'm going to talk about, but rather how the events were perceived. And I hope this will make sense as we go along. Now, we read Matthew's account earlier in the service, but for our sermon, I want to go to John's account, which is the shortest. And I want to concentrate on just one verse, but I'm going to read the whole account. So if you would, please follow along in your Bible as I read aloud. As I've said before, I think it's very important that you follow along and see the words of Holy Scripture on the page. John chapter 12, beginning at verse 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Sion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave, and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they had heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? 
Behold, the world is gone after him. Amen. Let us pray. Father, please help us now for these next few moments, uh, by the work of your Holy Spirit, to understand the text of Scripture before us. Please show us your Son today, and this we ask in his name. Amen. Uh, what's going on? Uh, what's going on? That's a question we're often prompted to ask. Uh, you come home after work to find the children fighting with each other, the house a mess and your spouse very cranky or very close to tears or perhaps both and you think to yourself, what's going on? <laughs> when I left this morning, it wasn't like this. Uh, you're at home one night and suddenly there is this terrible screeching outside and you think, what's going on? And then you realise it's your lovely cat engaged in a death match with another neighbourhood feline. Maybe you've been prompted to ask this about your own physical or mental health. Uh, you've experienced certain symptoms and you've thought to yourself, what's going on? <laughs> This is strange. I'm not usually like this. I was reading a news story on Monday evening about a political staffer in Parliament House who was sacked for engaging in some extremely inappropriate behaviour. And I remember thinking, what's going on? <laughs> what has our society come to? Have people completely lost their minds? Maybe this is something you find yourself asking with disturbing regularity when you watch the evening news or scroll through your Facebook feed. Uh, things are happening here and around the world that we can't get our heads around. This is the question that was flying around the city of Jerusalem on this particular day. Uh, Matthew, in his account, tells us that all the city was moved. Uh, the word carries the idea of being shaken as if by an earthquake. I can imagine people coming out into the streets and saying to their neighbours, what's going on? What's all this noise about? Uh, why are people streaming towards the temple? This question inevitably led to the one that Matthew records, chapter 21, verse 10, and when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? When this question was put to the multitude who had accompanied Jesus as he processed from Bethpage to the city, uh, the answer came back, verse 11, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And I think this is a rather fascinating statement. Uh, perhaps there was some local pride involved. Uh, there are scholars who say that there was a, a large number of pilgrims from Galilee in that multitude that came into the city with Jesus. And given how Galileans were often viewed by people in Jerusalem, they were very happy at this point to identify Jesus as one of their own. Uh, you think we're a bunch of uncultured, irreligious bogans from the country, but hey... <laughs> This is the guy from Galilee. He's the one everybody's celebrating. So take that, you Jerusalem snobs. <laughs> now maybe, maybe that was the sentiment in their answer. What strikes me about this statement is that it was correct. Jesus was the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And yet it wasn't the whole story. He was much more than a prophet. And furthermore, if during the procession these people were the ones crying out, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, why didn't they identify him that way when they were asked who he was? Why didn't they say, this is Jesus the Son of David, this is our King? <laughs> why did they say, this is Jesus the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee? I don't know. Maybe it wasn't the same people. Now we have to be careful not to read things into the text that aren't there. Matthew gives us a general overview of what took place. We don't know who exactly said what and what exactly they were thinking. 
But what we can reasonably conclude is that a lot of people that day didn't really understand what was happening and who Jesus actually was. And this included the 12 disciples. Now, of course, they were aware of the events they were witnessing and participating in. They saw Jesus ride the young donkey from Bethpage into the city. They were part of the procession. They were shoulder to shoulder with the crowd. They heard the hosannas ring out. And I'm sure they believed something significant was happening. How could they not have believed that? But the truth is, they didn't get it. They didn't grasp the significance of the events they were part of. This is what John tells us in his account. Look please at chapter 12 verse 16. I'll read from verse 14. John chapter 12 beginning at verse 14. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Sihon, behold thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. And here it is, these things understood not his disciples at the first. Now what I find interesting about this statement and even a bit funny is that John is dobbing himself in <laughs> and he was there. <laughs> he was probably as close to Jesus as anyone was but he freely admits that he didn't understand what was going on. Now John refers to these things in verse 16. These things understood not his disciples. What things? What exactly did they not understand? It was that Jesus was fulfilling Old Testament prophecy that day as he rode into Jerusalem. John makes the connection to the prophecy in Zechariah. He says that Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written. Then he proceeds to quote Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. And then in verse 11 he refers to the disciples remembering that these things were written of him. They knew something significant was taking place. They were swept up in the emotion of the day for sure. And I'm also sure that they had their own ideas about what was going to happen when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem. But at the same time, they did not recognise that Jesus was doing exactly what had been prophesied of the Messiah. They didn't see the events in biblical terms, if I can put it that way. On the day, not one of them said to the other, hold on a minute, uh, I remember hearing about this in the synagogue. Uh, this is what uh, 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 Zechariah, yeah, Zechariah spoke of this, didn't he? Look, there's Jesus sitting on the colt, riding towards Zion, and people are hailing him as the son of David. That never occurred to them. They missed the historical redemptive significance of the event they were part of. And if we can press a little deeper, John is telling us that the disciples' understanding of who Jesus was and what he had come to do was only partially informed by the Old Testament Scriptures. We know the disciples made some connections between the Old Testament and the person and work of Jesus. We see that at the beginning of John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 43 to 45, it says, The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So Philip made some connection between the Old Testament and Jesus. When Peter confessed Jesus to be the Christ in Matthew chapter 16, he was thinking in Old Testament categories. Uh, we don't have time to explore this today. The point simply is this. Peter's confession makes no sense without the Old Testament. He believed Jesus to be the person, God's anointed, that the Old Testament pointed to. But even so, it's evident that he and the other disciples had an incomplete understanding. Their vision of the Christ was limited and perhaps distorted by their own ideas and expectations. While they were with Jesus, 
There was much about Jesus that they didn't comprehend, even though it was right there in their Bible. The Bible that was read every Sabbath in every synagogue in Judea and Galilee and all around the Roman Empire. But thankfully, this is not where John's testimony ends. Look please once again at verse 16. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. Jesus was glorified through his death, burial, resurrection, ascension and enthronement. He was glorified as he moved from death to life, from seeming defeat to ultimate triumph. And John connects Jesus being glorified to the disciples remembering that these things were written of him. When Jesus was glorified, that's when they realised what was going on. On the day he rode into Jerusalem on a young donkey. Why? What was it about Jesus being glorified that caused the disciples to understand? Well, there were two parts to it. First of all, after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples and helped them understand who he was and why he had come. He comprehensively connected the dots between the Old Testament and himself. We see this in Luke chapter 24. Please turn over there if you will. Luke chapter 24, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 36. Luke chapter 24, verse 36. Luke says, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now drop down to verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. Verse 45. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning Jerusalem. Jesus opened their understanding to the scriptures and what they said about him and that must have been an incredible experience for the disciples. I would have loved to have been there for those Old Testament expositions from the lips of Jesus. I wonder if he mentioned Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. <laughs> You remember when I rode into Jerusalem on a donkey? Well, that's what Zechariah was talking about. These interactions with Jesus after the resurrection helped the disciples understand. But I don't think that's primarily what John was referring to in our text. When he says, these things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him. I think he is talking about something else that happened, something even more significant, and some of you know what it is. When Jesus was glorified, when he ascended into heaven and was enthroned at the Father's right hand, what did he and the Father do? They sent the Holy Spirit. John makes the connection between Jesus being glorified and the sending of the Spirit in a little side note in chapter 7. It's in parentheses in our English translation, John chapter 7 verse 39, it says, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. The connection is clear. Jesus is glorified, the Spirit is given. 
The Holy Spirit was given after Jesus ascended into heaven. It was given on the day of Pentecost. This is recorded in Acts chapter 2. And it was the Spirit who would, in Jesus' words, guide the disciples into all the truth. He would help them to understand the truth about who Jesus was and what he had accomplished by his life, death and resurrection and the fullness of their understanding is what we see in the book of Acts and in the New Testament epistles. We see that the Spirit did indeed guide them into all the truth. The Spirit glorified the Son through their ministry. When you read the sermons in the book of Acts, what you see is the apostles explaining the life, death and resurrection of Jesus in light of the Old Testament. They show that Jesus was the fulfilment, that Jesus was the one who David spoke of and Moses and the prophets. And that's what John is talking about in our verse. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The disciples understood that on that day, the king had come to his people, meek and lowly. He had come with salvation, just as Zechariah said he would. And even though the days that followed did not transpire as they had expected, they eventually understood that he did indeed bring salvation. He entered the city in triumph on a donkey. He exited the city in shame carrying a cross and that's how he did it. That's how he brought salvation. And one day shortly thereafter, Peter would stand before a crowd in Jerusalem and say, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. This is our Palm Sunday message for 2021. I hope you can see the change in the disciples' perspective. They didn't understand what was going on, but eventually they did. And there are some things in this for our Christian lives. I'm going to leave you with three thoughts by way of application. These are the points for you to ponder this afternoon and into this week. Point number one, Jesus' disciples don't always know what's going on. <laughs> Jesus' disciples don't always know what's going on. We have to remember that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that young donkey, the disciples weren't sceptics. Uh, the disciples weren't curious bystanders. The disciples weren't members of the crowd who were swept up in the moment. No, they believed in Jesus. They were on Team Jesus, if I can put it like that. And they had been for nearly three years. They weren't the people who stopped following Jesus when he said hard things, but even they didn't grasp what was happening. Their understanding was incomplete. Their faith was weak. They had a long way to go. And so it is with Jesus' disciples today. We, we don't always know what's going on, and not just out there in the world, but in our own lives and in our own spiritual experience. At times, our understanding is incomplete. Our faith is weak. We struggle to view our experience in biblical terms. We find it hard to make sense of things and to grasp the promises of God. And that's okay. God is sympathetic to our weakness and our confusion. God doesn't expect us to be the finished article. And he is more patient and more compassionate than we often imagine him to be. After the disciples' monumental failure, what did Jesus do? He came to them. He cooked them breakfast on the beach at Galilee he spoke words of comfort and truth to them. He bound up their broken spirits and put them back on their feet. 
as I said, our Lord is more patient and more compassionate than we often imagine him to be. We are weak, we are flawed, we find the Christian life to be very difficult at times and that's okay. That's the normal Christian experience. Christ will help us and we ought to help each other. We ought to be patient and gracious and kind to each other. We shouldn't expect others to be the finished article when we know full well that we're not. Others need to grow just as we do. Let's not forget that. Jesus' disciples don't always know what's going on. And then point number two, Jesus' disciples need the Holy Spirit. Jesus' disciples need the Holy Spirit. This has been a bit of a theme over the last few weeks as we've been in the Gospel of John in our home groups and in the last couple of sermons on Sunday. It was the presence and ministry of the Holy Spirit that helped the disciples understand the Scriptures and make sense of Jesus. They wouldn't have got there without the Spirit. And the same is true for us. The Spirit helps us understand the Scriptures. He helps us understand who Jesus is and the significance of his life, death and resurrection. He guides us into the truth. He glorifies the Son for us, for our benefit. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. We know. We understand what God has freely given to us in his word and in the person and work of his son by his spirit. God the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of our understanding. He presses the truth upon our conscience. He helps us to know how to apply what God has said to our day-to-day lives and we call that wisdom. We need him. We need him to do this work for us because left to our own devices, left to our own understanding, we're in trouble. And you know it and I know it. (laughs) There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We need the Spirit. Every day we need the light that he gives, the assurance, the the comfort. And that means we should be very careful not to quench him. We can do that. We can suppress the Spirit's ministry instead of being filled by him. And we quench him by ignoring the means by which he ministers to us, ignoring the word and prayer and the gathering of the saints on the Lord's day. We suppress his ministry by being selfish, by filling our lives with sin. That's like throwing dirt on a fire. Is that what you're doing? Throwing dirt on the fire, quenching the spirit. Maybe you want to feel the joy of the spirit. You want the the wisdom the Spirit gives. Maybe you're longing for more than a superficial peace, a peace that's not so easily disturbed. You're aching for these things in your life, but you're not experiencing them. They seem to be out of your reach. Would this be why? There are things in your life that are stifling the ministry of the Spirit, things that are dimming His light. Jesus' disciples don't always know what's going on. Jesus' disciples need the Holy Spirit. And then finally, point number three, Jesus' disciples take comfort in God's sovereignty. Or the longer version might be something like this. Jesus' disciples take comfort in knowing that God is always working out his purposes in their lives and in the world. I'll give you the long version again. Jesus' disciples take comfort in in knowing that God is always working out his purposes in their lives and in the world. Now, the great English pastor and theologian J.C. Ryle has a wonderful little paragraph about this in his notes on our verse. 
I put it in the outline for you. You can follow along as I read it. He writes, The disciples found, long after the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, that they had been unconscious actors in a mighty accomplishment of Scripture. This is a thought for all of us. We have not the least idea, during the greater part of our lives, how much of God's great purposes on earth are being carried on through us and by us without our being conscious of it. The full extent to which they are carried on, we shall never know till we wake up in another world. We shall then discern with wonder and amazement the full meaning of many a thing in which we were unconscious agents during our lives. That's a great thought, isn't it? It's so encouraging. <laughs> Things might not make sense now, <laughs> but one day they will. And we can have this assurance because God is over all things. He is working all things after the counsel of his own will. Our lives and this world are heading towards the end that he has ordained. It's so good to know that someone knows. And he knows because it all belongs to him. It's his world. We are his people. He is at the beginning and he is at the end. His purposes are always, always being worked out in our lives through the ups and the downs, the triumphs and the failures and everything in between. Trust him. Trust him. With whatever you're going through at the moment, trust him. He knows what he's doing. And he loves you more than you could ever Imagine. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king has come. He is just and lowly and has brought salvation. Amen.